the very first pictures of Count Dracula. <laughs> Guys, we are very lucky today to have the Indiana Jones of Dracula researchers with us. This is a man named Hans de Roos, who you have probably heard me refer to many times on this channel. And he is uh, sort of a superstar in the Dracula community in the fact that this is the man who has found the location of Dracula's castle, has found the location of the Sholomance, the school of the black arts referred to in Dracula. He's also the guy who discovered the Icelandic version of Dracula and found out that it was different than the published version of Dracula in English and all kinds of other discoveries. And he has a brand new venture that he's working on right now, which I am very excited to talk to him about. So everybody, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Hans de Roos. Thank you very much for joining us, Hans. Thank you. Thank you again for, for introducing me with such uh, uh, lauding words. I'm, uh, I'm blushing here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's absolutely my pleasure. Um, and uh, the, the, reason, the reason why uh, I asked Hans to, uh, to come and talk to us today is because he is currently, his, his current project is that he is restoring and republishing the very first illustrations of Dracula ever. And these come from the Swedish version of Dracula, which if that sounds strange to you, just wait until we get into this. So Hans currently has a, a Kickstarter up that uh, where you can buy these uh, illustrations in a wonderful book format that he's putting together. We'll get to that in a little bit. But first, Hans, if you could give us a primer on what this is and, and where these illustrations come from and why they're important. Okay, to start with important, they are important and unique because they are the very first illustrations of the Dracula story. Uh, before that, we only have a cover illustration of the Hungarian edition, which was published as a book in autumn 1898. And that's just a single image that shows Dracula more like a kind of Santa Claus <laughs> with a <laughs> very messy beard, big teeth, but not very sharp. Uh, a really old man that could scare children, but not really us. And after this illustration, uh, this single illustration, we have then a whole series of illustrations in the Swedish newspapers, uh, more than 150 drawings, pen and ink drawings, that illustrate more or less the complete story from beginning to end, but of course with a twist because the story has been uh, adapted and modified. So. Uh this Swedish newspaper is doing what uh, what a lot of newspapers back in that time period did, which was you know publish a publish a sort of serialized version of a story to get people to buy every issue of the newspaper, if if I've got that right. Um, yeah, sure. And so they started publishing Dracula piece by piece, but the twist is that the story that's published in the Swedish newspaper is very different than the actual novel. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. that, that's correct. Uh, the, the beginning is, uh, is nearly identical. It's Harker traveling to Transylvania, uh, getting in the stagecoach to the castle. That's all very similar. But what we then see in the Swedish version here, stay there is uh, described more in detail and their difference. The Count is not alone. He has a niece, he says, a young lady with blonde hair. He has a housekeeper who cannot talk and hear. So that's already one difference. And then in the end, Harker discovers that in the basement of the castle, there live a whole horde of ape-like followers that 
engage in uh, sacrificial ceremonies where young girls are killed on an altar stone. And Good Lord. So the third point is that that he he is uh, the leader and financier of a uh, political conspiracy that tries to overthrow uh, democracy in England and other Western countries. Wow, so that is that's, that is a much <laughs> wider scope than than the book that we're all so accustomed to. Um, yeah. So so then in that case, how exactly did this happen? Like, like how how did this how did this Swedish version of Dracula come to be so very different than the published version in England? Uh, that that's the big riddle that we are still working on, so to say. And there, there are uh, two different theories. Uh, the one of which I was originally. Uh, 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 let's say, what I originally supported and even launched when the Icelandic version was discovered, is that Stoker himself either used an older version, an older draft of Dracula uh, that, that he had discarded later, but would be good for exports, so to say, or that he tried his hand at a more uh, extended and more erotic version of the story that he could not publish because of the very strict morals there, the Victorian uh, censorship, so to say, that was uh, done by, by, by the publishers. So that's, that's the idea number one. And we find some support of this idea uh, in the fact that some of Stoker's notes, some early notes about Dracula, seem to correspond to the changes uh, that we find in the Swedish version. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you think that Stoker was the actual author of this Swedish version in some way? Um, there comes the second theory, the one I'm supporting uh, more uh, right now, and that is that the, the Swedish newspaper guys probably uh, just made up this whole story, uh, made their own modification based on their own ideas, their own literary backgrounds. And uh, one of the reasons I think that this is more accurate is that the preface of the Swedish uh, story uh, was copied more or less from the memoirs of a Lutheran priest that lived in Stockholm uh, around the same time. Really? Wow. And these, these memoirs had just been published in March uh, 1899, just three months before the first installment uh, started in that newspaper. And if you compare it sentence for sentence, word for word, it is very clear, it is unmistakable that it is a plagiarism of, of the ideas that have been worded by this priest, uh, Bernard Wattström. And because Stoker didn't speak Swedish, he, he didn't write Swedish, he probably never knew about these memoirs uh, being out there. Uh, I'm quite convinced that this plagiarism and this, this, this whole preface was invented by Swedish writers, not by Stoker. And if the preface is a plagiarism or is a fake, so to say, the name Stoker is under it, uh, B dot s dot then the whole story is probably uh, adapted by the swedish and not by stoker that that is my latest insight interesting that is fascinating so i think that the uh, real connection may have been via hungary via hungary How, this i have not heard this what 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 happened in hungary okay the the hungary connection Interesting thing is that there was an international conference of press people in Stockholm in 1897, in the summer of 1897. It was at the same time, it was a world exhibition. And all press people from all over the world were there at the Ford International uh, Press uh, Press Congress. One of the most important uh, participants there was uh, Eugène Rakosi, who was the Hungarian newspaper man who had published the very first translation of Dracula to Hungarian. 
uh, which was a true translation. And he was there almost certainly together with uh, the um, chief chief editor of the Swedish newspaper that later published the uh, the Swedish version. Interesting. So it's uh, and they kept in touch. They kept uh, the, after that uh, the, the the Hungarians uh, kept writing to Sweden and to this special newspaper Aftonbladet. Uh, congratulations to the king. They made, they made even the travel. They, they stayed in Sweden for three more weeks, and this newspaper kept reporting on that. So I think that there was a uh, contact between colleagues from Hungary, from Budapest to Stockholm, and maybe the the, the very fact that the Hungarians had already published in translation of this story uh, inspired the, the Swedes to do the same. Um, all without Stoker's knowledge, just piracy, because at that time uh, there was no uh, Ghent Geneva Convention, or at least Sweden had not signed up for it yet. So it was completely legal for Swedish uh, newspapers just to pick any story they want from the world and adapt it and publish it. Wow, that is fascinating. Mm -hmm. so, so let me ask you this. At, uh, what was it like when you first made the realization that there had been adaptations of Dracula in various international newspapers that were different from Stoker's version? What, what, what was uh, How did that moment go for you? When I started translating fragments of the, of the complete text, not only the preface, which was already known, but scenes from the castle, later scenes. I, I put them into Google Translator, and although this, this, this translation, of course, was far from perfect, sure. I, I just entered new characters, new, new persons that were playing a role there, new events uh, taking place at other locations. <laughs> then, like, so what is far, all of this? <laughs> what is all of this? That's amazing. Yeah, we, I, it was amazing. At that time, I had I had some interns in my studio because I normally I work on photos. We do Photoshop. We we make photo stories, uh, and uh, we discussed it. And we were all flabbergasted. You know, this is not what Dolby thought. He thought it is a condensed translation, shortened, cheap edition. You know, some minor products uh, of uh, of an Icelandic publisher. And now we found out that the story had very new elements, that there were a, lo a love encounter between this blonde vampire girl and Jonathan Harker that did not stop at the first bite, but continued. And he was obsessed with her, wanted to meet again. In Dracula, he's after the first encounter when she is already attempting to to bite him he is repulsed by her by her and and her two sisters and never wants to meet them again but this time he's arranging for secret rendezvous or she comes sneaking up to him the count is trying to intervene like a jealous father you know that is going to stop the illicit love couple <laughs> and <laughs> And I, 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 I love this. And then uh, the rest of the story in Icelandic, it's quite condensed. No? But as we see later, uh, only uh, that is because it was a translation from a Swedish version that was already condensed. And the Icelandic translator, Asmundsen, he condensed it still further. So it's just like a little tale following the adventures of Harker in Castle Dracula. But still, it was interesting to see, for example, that the Count was terminated still in London. He's uh, not fleeing back to Transylvania with, with the whole crew of light following him by, uh, by train and boat and horseback and boats and whatever. Uh, he is killed in his own villa 
in Hampstead, not Carfax Abbey. Carfax Abbey never existed, of course. It is never referred to in Dracula. But he had a villa in Hampstead where there was also a basement. And there he is found in his coffin by Van Helsing and his crew. And uh, Van Helsing puts his dagger in his breast. And there he crumbles into ashes and disappears. So this is very similar, of course, to the later uh, stage version and the Dracula 1931 movie version. Oh, sure. Right, right. Where, where the, the whole story is, is, is shortened and the end also takes place in the basement of Dracula's lair. Right. So I started thinking, did the filmmakers know about this Icelandic version? How come it's <laughs> that this is so similar? <laughs> Not a big, big, big riddle. <laughs> gotcha. That is fascinating. So then to get back to the illustrations, the illustrations uh, basically are kind of like it when you line them all up together in this book that you're making. It's almost sort of like a picture book story of this alternate version. Yeah, yeah. You see all the dramatic action, of course. Now, for example, the girl being attacked and slaughtered on this altar stone or how the count is finally terminated by van helsing and then there are also pictures that or you see the murdered there's a murdered peasant girl that harker spots from the window with his binoculars you see a, a half denuded girl laying there out in the bushes so that's very dramatic his encounter with the vampire girl and then there are a number of pictures that are just depicting people having conversation, reading a book, writing a letter, uh, traveling, and so on. So it is, it is like a comic uh, without the text balloons. It is a, a, a very, very complete uh, depiction of of the of the whole story. Gotcha. And that to to now to get to the the Kickstarter that Hans is running. You have mm. taken all of these, all of these illustrations, or or at least a lot of them, anyway, and have yeah. uh, and are are printing them in a book that uh, is a gorgeous looking hardbound uh, edition uh, that you are you are selling on this Kickstarter. Uh, can you tell us about sort of what 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 it's going to be like? Yeah, sure. Uh... The, the I found this this drawing so unique, and then not only because they were the first, but because they also I found them very lively and very modern in a certain sense, quite dynamic in the in the in the in the stroke in the technique. So I worked from high resolution scans uh, of 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 the newspaper, and uh, of course, if you blow them up to full page, you see a, a lot of noise as you call it uh, in, sure. the, in, in the picture and the lines are not sharp uh, if you try to increase the contrast and we uh, either the black lines are melting together or the the whites are taking over and you have interruption in the line so i started uh, with these digital files and restored them more or less to more uh, fluent and consistent drawings and colorized them and a first edition was was already issued in 2021 also through kickstarter but uh there were still more drawings that were interesting so we now have a collection of i think about 100 drawings that all have been digitally restored and colorized in a high resolution like like 70 megapixels or something so you can print posters of that and, and <laughs> hang it cover your whole wall with it it is uh, it, that wall behind you. you you can have a two meter high <laughs> absolutely that's uh, that's amazing i can uh, and i've i've seen i've seen a bunch of of the illustrations and i'm i'm obsessed with this image of Dracula with the big, the red cloak with the, the, the pin or the brooch of the green serpent. And I'm just like, yeah. oh my God, like that would absolutely go great on this wall. But that's, that's just like, it's such an amazing, like what, what was going on there? Like, like who came up with that and what does it mean? And uh, that's, that's another riddle still that we, we have not been able to solve. Uh, 
this this serpent like brush that you talk about it is it is an s shape sitting on his chest and everyone of course who's familiar with with the, the history of us comics uh, is reminded of superman oh that's true has, yeah yeah <laughs> has the same big s on. <laughs> That's quite a crossover there. <laughs> it's, it's, it, yeah, I think again, uh, uh, I, I, I was not able to prove any uh, connection. I, the, 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 Swede, the, the Swedish illustration was certainly not known in the 1930s when uh, Superman was invented. So it right, must be right. a queen. But it, uh, it was fascinating, of course, to see Dracula. Also, the Red Cape, which came also much, much later uh, right. to, to Dracula. Uh, uh, Lugosi, he had a, a cape that was a black cape, but the idea that that the vampire wears a red cape was picked up much much later in in in, in movies. I think the the Swedish guys they already anticipated some of the necessities to adapt the story a bit to make it even more appealing to a broad public, uh, shortening it. Uh, Having it end still in London, and and the role of Dracula as a as a kind of society figure. That's another big difference with Dracula. In Dracula, uh, in uh, the the witchy part and after the witchy part, Dracula's always hiding. He is just confronted right. once, right? Uh, uh, at the Piccadilly house when when they are looking for the for the boxes with holy earth, and then he he comes in and confronts them, and his travel money is falling from his pockets. Uh, what we see in the 1931 movie is what we also see in the 1899 Swedish version. That is that uh, Count Dracula has a very nice villa. It is refurbished in very exotic style. Uh, lots of people gather there, diplomats, high society uh, of London. Uh, they having soirees there. Uh, there is a demonstration of his hypnotic powers and uh, that is also necessary because he is uh, trying to undermine the British democracy and British Parliament, the, the whole sta state apparatus of, uh, of, of England, using his diplomatic contacts and his money. So he is not hiding, he is... Uh, a, a host of a party and walks around very proud with his countess that he has by his side. Uh, in the end, it seems that they were all uh, under his influence and uh, hypnotized maybe, but he is elegant. He is dominant. He is eloquent. Very different from uh, the, the scenes that we know from the second part of Dracula. That's fantastic. So uh, I highly recommend this this book. I have the earlier version of it myself, and that one by itself is gorgeous. This would really make an excellent gift to whomever the vampire lover is in your life, which mm -hmm. is probably you if you're if you're watching this video. <laughs> but uh, but I I recommend that uh, that you you check out the Kickstarter. If people happen to watch this after the Kickstarter is over, will there be any uh, any copies of this left over to order, or is it just sort of a one and done kind of thing? Yeah, if we get this funded, we'll have uh, I think up to five hundred copies printed. It makes no sense to print less than that because uh, the whole book can be printed in two minutes. You know, these are huge Heidelberg machines with four colors, and uh, I don't save any money if I just print hundreds or 300 or 500 copies. So I think there will be some copies left, and then you can order them through my website, uh, which is The Vamp Vault, www.vampvault.yimdofree.com. Excellent. And I'll put a link for that down below uh, in the description for this video so that anybody can click on that and go straight to it. Um, Please do. It's all about my research there. Most of my essays are uh, available for free there as PDF. So, and that uh, it's, that is amazing as well. And thank you for sharing those with the world for free to be able to 
you know, see see what your discoveries are and, you know, and how you back all those up. Yeah, it has to, to get out to the world. Um, I, otherwise, it's useless for me uh, trying to decipher all these riddles. And then in the end, uh, uh, maybe after 10 years, it will appear as an academic book that costs 103 pounds uh, and is only accessible for just a few libraries, you know. Yeah, exactly. So let me let me ask you this then just because, something that I've I've always been curious about you know kind of following your work is how exactly did you sort of get bitten by this this bug to to want to research the mysteries of Dracula um where do I start I start in Austria in 2010 uh or maybe i should start in munich in 1992 that is when the first uh showing was of the american coppola movie yeah Bram Stoker, it came to munich then uh, i watched it and i was uh, fascinated by the story of course it was also a bit different there was this love story that had been invented this, this kind of reincarnation of a lost love but it always uh, kept spinning in my head, especially also the role of Mina uh, that was uh, played by Winona Ryder. Winona Ryder, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've maybe seen the movie a couple times. I, yeah, yeah. I, I think I watched it six times. I'm just <laughs> my memory. <laughs> Fading. And Lucy Westenra was also very impressive, uh, uh, an English actress that never uh, gathered much fame later on, but uh, played this role. And this was in my mind when in 2010 I was in Austria at an exhibition with a, a lot of people gathering there. And I met the daughter of an old friend of mine. She's from Sweden. Big uh, coincidence now, of course. <laughs> <in respect. laughs> <laughs> she was interested in doing a photo series with me about some Victorian romantic gothic theme. And first we talked about Jekyll and Hyde, about doing some scenes from Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, then we talked about Swan Lake from Tchaikovsky in, in, a, in a gothic adaptation. And in the end, I reminded I was reminded of the, of the Dracula movie I'd seen and I said, why don't we do some scenes? where you represent Mina in this Dracula story. And when we were developing and we were looking for costumes and, and backgrounds, and we, we, we had to remodel the whole studio, then I thought, okay, if you already do it with Turbine, also not put in the Lucy Westenra. I had a model from Switzerland, she watched Lucy Westenra. And then it's kind of developed that we wanted to do the whole story. So we have more than 40, uh, big plate pictures again, big enough to cover your whole wall. Uh, that <laughs> published, <laughs> published in the Ultimate Dracula. Let me let me get the book. Yeah, please. I was just I was yeah. This is the Ultimate Dracula. Oh you wow! See it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big enough to to cover me half. It's a heavy book with very. Interesting maps. Which oh, we'll nice. Talk about later. But it also has the illustrated Dracula story. Oh, excellent. This is Lucy, for example. Excellent. And so is that so just, is that a, is that sort of like a, a, a book of images? It, it doesn't have like, it's not a reprinting of the, the novel, I'm assuming. It is both. It is oh. both. It is the, uh, I, I planned it as an illustrated version of Dracula because I had this photo story complete with, with, with the 40 big plates and uh, I think about a dozen actors and models that had participated. We worked one year on photoshopping everything so that everything looks nice and smooth and has interesting backgrounds. And now back to your question, how I got into the research. When I was planning the book, I said, okay, we need, we need a preface. We need a kind of introduction. Uh, so that is the first time I really looked into the Dracula story and the academic 
studies that had been uh, created about it, uh, Elizabeth Miller, uh, Etim Bisson, uh, uh, lots of books came on my table. I wrote an introduction about the development of Dracula from a, let's say, from a uh, repulsive villain to a more romantic hero, as we see today. And then I thought, oh, wouldn't be nice, wouldn't it be nice if you have just some maps with the story so that people can see where the characters are traveling. And then I started looking into this geography and that, that became the Dracula maps. It's a 50 page essay with uh, a lot of, of big scale maps. And uh, especially, of course, I, I wanted to, to, to put a little cross on the place where the castle was. And then I found out no one had found it yet. <laughs> so you went looking. I went looking, and I, 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 of course, there there were some people that had tried, like Walker and Writer, two geogra uh, uh, geographers from the U.S. who had been speaking at the 1997 Congress, uh, the Shade and the Shadow, and they had three different maps where the castle was in three different places. So I said I have to be more precise. I have to be more accurate. And uh, luckily, of course, I that was 2011. Internet was already functioning quite well, and there were uh, lots of highly detailed military maps from that time available. The, the Habsburg military surveys. Okay. That that showed this landscape in very high detail and. Uh, I, I put all these scans together till I uh, had the the area we were talking about, and I just started looking at it and trying to reconstruct the the, the hints from the novel uh, by setting out routes on that map. And it took me, I think, three months. Wow! Till I was nearly certain that the castle must be on the edge of a big volcanic uh, caldera, a big extinct volcano that is placed in the Kalimani mountains south of the Borgo Pass. And when I was already done with the layout of the book, I thought, why not look into Stoker's notes one last time to see if there are any hints to the geography of Transylvania and Moldavia where the travels take place. And uh, that is when I came across a very cryptic note about the Sirid and the Bestritza joining together at Fundu and another line that said between Straja and Isferul is a point with the coordinates 47 degrees uh, north latitude, 25 three quarters degrees east longitude. Stoker had mixed up longitude and latitude, but that was quite easy to solve because if you did not change that, then you would end up in the Arabian desert. And now this point was pointing at the border crossing that indeed was on the uh, Habsburg maps exactly between Straja on the river Bistritza and a mountain called Israel on this caldera. And I already knew about this mountain because I had studied this ridge and there were four or five mountain tops that would qualify as the possible location of, of, uh, of the castle. And now I find the, na the name of one of these mountains in Stoker's notes, and <laughs> you just have to draw a line. You just have to draw a line, and you see what he is meaning. <laughs> gotcha. So he he put the X marks the spot right there uh, in his notes. He X X marks it, and then that is the other important insight I think of 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 my uh, of my uh, book in 2012 and my essays. He covered it up again. Now, as you as you will uh, remember from Dracula, uh, Jonathan falls asleep during the last part of his travel to the castle. Right. Van Helsing and Mina also fall asleep. There are snowstorms that make it impossible to see any 
details of the landscape. He doesn't mention landmarks. So for the reader of the book, of the Dracula book, it is not possible easily to reconstruct which, which place he had in mind because he didn't want, that's what I think, he didn't want any of his critics to point out, oh, that mountain that you're describing, there's nothing there, there's no no castle there, you're making it all up. He wanted to make a story that could, could not be disproven. Right, right. That, that, the, yeah. the mystery is always more compelling than the truth. <laughs> Thank you very much for walking us through how you found the location of Dracula's castle. That is fabulous. So then let me ask you then, uh, sort of as, as sort of a wrap-up question to all of this amazing information you've shared with us, is there, is there, are there mysteries about Dracula that you currently are hunting down or would like to know the answers to? Um... The biggest riddle still is for me uh, the Swedish edition. How, how did it come about? I have a theory, uh, the, the Hungary connection, but I don't have proof. Uh, of course, it would be so nice if you could find any scrap of paper that is, let's say, a contract with the translator, with the editor, or a little note between uh, the Swedish and the Hungarian newspaper guys, or uh, some kind of thing. Uh, I I just cannot get my finger on it because I, I cannot go so deep into the archives. Uh, maybe it doesn't exist. I asked uh, university libraries for for uh, correspondence. Also the friends of Stoker that lived in Stockholm. There are some letters. We dug them out with, with the help of another Swedish, uh, Irish, a Swedish Irish translator who is living there. Helped me a lot. And... Um, we, we don't have any definitive proof. So it is all, in the end, it is speculation. And I think it's not bad speculation. It is, uh, I think it's quite probable what, what, what we are thinking, but uh, we, we cannot uh, show it to the world. Like the notes, the notes that show the Israel, that's written, you know, I, I think right. there's no way around it. But for the Swedish uh, connection, of course, we are still tapping in the dark and, and hoping that someday some diary or memoirs uh, will will show up. Interesting. That is interesting. Okay. Now, I even, I even had contact with the descendants of uh, Albert Anderson Edenberg, which I think is the uh, translator and, and the editor of the Swedish version. I am in touch with people in, in the United States. Uh, he's their great grand uncle or something. But not nothing, nothing written that would uh, really pinpoint it. So if I ever find that, or if someone else find that, and I don't have to find everything myself, that would be <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be great. Of course, if you can solve this mystery, that's excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well. If you would permit me, I have five very simple questions that I ask everyone that I interview uh, right at the okay. end, just to get sort of a baseline on sort of everyone in, in the vampire world. Um, so answer these however you want. Uh, the first question mm -hmm. is, uh, and I think you've already kind of answered this, but, but feel free to, uh, to elaborate if you want. But what was your entry point into the vampire genre? Uh, again? The movie, Coppola, but even before that, Coppola 1992, I saw in Munich when it premiered uh, there or came first there and Leopold Strauss, you know, uh, I was just very impressed by the whole imagery, by the acting, by, 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 by the, the whole mystique of the story. Uh, vampires, a bit earlier, I think I saw Polanski the fearless vampire. Oh, killers. right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something that is not impressive in a dramatic sense, but it was incredibly funny. I, <laughs> I saw it. <laughs> I saw it in in Paris with a friend of mine. We had nothing to do. Okay, let's watch a movie with English subtitles, you know. And we saw the fearless vampire killers, and I, I still have the movie. I still have a DVD of it, and. 
sometimes when new new friends or guests are coming here i say okay let's watch this because it's hilarious and and funny so these are my two main entry points until i started to visualize the dracula story myself in 2010. that's an excellent answer okay uh so second question what is your favorite thing to eat for breakfast Tea is very important. Tea, excellent. Before anything else, otherwise I I cannot speak and wake up. <laughs> uh, then, then for eating, uh, mostly here we make toast breads. Uh, we have found a shop here on the island. I live on a. Maybe I should explain that to your viewers. Please. Uh, we, we live on a little tropical island in the Philippines. Uh, there's about hundred thousand people there. And until a couple of years ago, it was impossible to buy cheese here. And as a Dutchman, of course, I... <laughs> cheese is... Like, I'm, I need my cheese. <laughs> it is the cornerstone of my existence. So <laughs> we were so happy that at last there was a supermarket established in Bantayan town. And they sell Gouda, Parmesan cheese, uh, Italian cheese. Uh, Greek cheese, so that comes on my breakfast table. Some cheese, uh, maybe some Würstchen, uh, some sausages. You can buy Hungarian sausages also here. I like that. Uh, eggs, uh, sunny side up or omelet. That and and sometimes as a special treat, I eat pindakas, which you won't understand because it's a Dutch word. It's peanut butter. Oh, okay. In Holland, in Holland, it is it is very usual to put that on your bread. You know, the Dutch they 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 for breakfast they have bread. Of course, they um, eat bread also for lunch. They only eat warm in the evening. Philippines eat warm three times per day, but peanut butter is also one of my favorites. That's excellent. I I too <laughs> have peanut butter on bread. Several, several times during the month for yeah. breakfast. So yeah. that's excellent. Um, okay, so question number three. And again, I, I, I maybe can guess the answer to this, but um, if you could talk to any vampire creator, author, director, uh, and ask them a question, who would that person be? What do you think the question would be? I think Coppola would be again my go-to director to to ask him. Um, a story is pretty obvious. Uh, I could ask him, of course, why did he uh, bring in this 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 love story, this romance between Plit, uh, Prince Vlad of Sikesh or whatever he's called. And, and Mina, it was just James Hart, I think, who wrote the script. And uh, for me as a viewer, if you just sit back and just for entertainment, uh, of course, it is an enrichment of the whole story. Uh, it gives an extra layer of, of meaning to all what is happening. Um, for what reason did he go along or did he insert this love story? Uh, was it just to attract a broader audience, a female audience, perhaps a romantic audience or a young audience? Or uh, did he think there was any any clue in Dracula that would lead to, to this construction uh, in the movie? That, that might be a question I, I would like to discuss. It would lead probably to many other questions <laughs> <laughs> well if any of us that's, never find ourselves in a room with francis ford coppola I, I i think i think we would all love to ask a bunch of questions uh, of him yeah. about this movie um yeah. well let me let me then expand on that just real quickly because i'm i'm interested if mm -hmm. you had a time machine and could go back and ask bram stoker any question is there mm -hmm. one that you would want most to know the answer from him oh many <laughs> most most maybe 
okay, just the confirmation of my 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 theory. Did you really pick that mountaintop, Israel, as the location of your castle, or did I just make it up? <laughs> uh, that would be a big relief for me if you said yes, Hans, you're right. That was <laughs> exactly what I had in mind. Well, the other thing, of course, would be: uh, Did he ever have any any contact with Swedish journalists and newspaper men? Did, was he aware that his story was being uh, modified for for a Swedish and then for an Icelandic audience? Um, and for the Hungarian version, I'm pretty sure that it was uh, without his knowledge, because uh, the newspaper man called Stoker an American, so wow. twice. So wow. I, I, th I think there were no personal friends. Gotcha. So <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> but but for 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 the Swedish, of course, it is it is the, the the core miracle of this whole story about the the Scandinavian version. So okay. I would ask that. All right. Uh, four, fourth question out of the five. Yeah. Do you have any habits or superstitions? when you sit down to work? Important is uh, I like it to be quiet around me. That's why I, I, I mostly work in the late evening and, and into the night. Maybe it's just because I'm a night owl, I can better focus. And I, I just love it when no one is interrupting me, calling me, I have to go down to look at the baby or to have a snack or whatever. Um, if it's very, very important, I need to clean up my attic. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> I feel that I need a sacred surrounding, so to say, so that I can fully focus. Um, and the rest is I, I work like, like a maniac. I try to follow every hint, even if it doesn't look promising, I just enter it into Google, try to find any documents, any books that that deal with that idea. And then I save it. Uh, so the way I work is I'm creating a, a database, so to say, on each subject I'm working on. I have hundreds of folders in which I uh, save websites, snippets from books, uh, images, for example. Images, that, that, that is maybe the most distinctive thing in my method. I cannot work without images. And I, I cannot, yeah, it's maps, it's paintings, it's whatever. If, if I, uh, I need to visualize it, and I think it's very important also for my essays that I publish, that they are illustrated and people can look at, at these images. Uh, I don't understand how other uh scholars can 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 write a four thousand let uh a word essay and there's not a single picture in it is uh, <laughs> gotcha <laughs> that's fabulous okay well so then uh that just brings us to the fifth and final question which is which actor who played dracula was your favorite Go back to the, the the vampire hunters. I think that that has coined my image of Dracula. Uh, Freddie Mines, I think, was his name. He was a the, the the British actor that played Count Dracula in um, in the Polanski movie. Gotcha. And I think he is extremely impressive and also very funny when he is imitating. There's this Professor Ambrosius. Uh, that talk, talks the way uh, try, he, he, he somehow uh, misspeaks himself and talks about vampires and then he's talking about bats that are flattering <laughs> and, and the Count is imitating him. We just... <laughs> I, loved, I loved that scene. Uh, then, of course, uh, the, the Hammer series, Christopher Lee is also very impressive. I was not so. I mean, I, I I'm sure that that uh, Gary Oldman did a fantastic job with 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 the Dracula version of Coppola, but uh, it was a bit too exotic for me with his mm -hmm. hair mm -hmm. up to top of his head and so on. Uh, uh, I th I think the other two are are more straight to the point. 
And if you want to get an impression how Dracula really looked like, like the book, you should look at the work of uh, Enrique uh, from Mexico. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Enrique Palafox, is, who, who we have had Palafox, on the show. Prof Professor Dr. Palafox. Oh, that's right. Who is... <laughs> who has uh, reconstructed, so to say, the appearance from Dracula and is modeling it in 3D. Uh, it's not an acting, of course, but I'm very impressed with his work to to visualize the the Dracula face uh, from, from the hints that we have in the book. That's fabulous. Okay. Well, Hans, it has been absolutely fantastic talking to you. If people want to uh, get in touch with you, ask you questions, what's the best way of doing that? Go to my website. There's there's a, a little contact form there. You just have to 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 write your text there and give your uh, email address, and it automatically lands in my email inbox. So it is again the www.vanfold.yimdofree.com <laughs> there you find me <laughs> there you find me that's it perfect it comes to my email and i'll answer it uh, as i see it that's wonderful well thank you very much for taking the time hans uh, we really appreciate your words i i really appreciate your your preparedness to 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 record all this and to ask all these questions and to uh, to give me a chance to present what i what i have been working on it is my pleasure entirely that was a lot of fun uh i have met hans before at the children of the night uh dracula congress but never really got that much of a chance to talk to him so this was fantastic being able to sort of pick his brain about all of the things that he's found out. Um, obviously, the Kickstarter, uh, if you are watching this during the next couple weeks, the Kickstarter is running. Feel free to run over there and, and pick up a copy of this book for yourself. The link is below. And for those of you who are perhaps going to be going to WonderCon here in Anaheim in 2024, I'm going to be doing a panel there called Your Vampire Story. And that is going to be on Saturday, the 30th of March, uh, at the Anaheim Convention Center. And my panel is going to be from 1.30 to 2.30. So if you happen to be around WonderCon, please come by and say hi. It would be great to meet you. Otherwise, thank you very much for being here for this special episode with Hans de Roos. And we will see you next time. <laughs>